Retirement will retire before you do, at least according to some doomsday economists. They say impending recessions, a drop in birth rates, and the younger generation's insistence on never having kids means the West is set to have an aging population that will make Japan's situation look like Neverland. But with its dependency on a stable economy, you can see why some fear will be working until the day the Grim Reaper hands us a pink slip. Just look at what happened in France when the government delayed the retirement age by just a few years. Civil unrest, riots, and a whole bunch of angry French people. Nobody wants to see that. Then again, maybe the doomsdayers are throwing the retirement baby out with the economic bathwater. Retirement policy is a relatively new idea in the grand scheme of things, and a hard-fought right too. Perhaps it's still got a few more years left before it's time to call it a day and move to Florida. So how have attitudes towards retirement changed over the centuries? How did retirement even catch on? And will emerging tech and cultural ideas make retirement easier or obsolete? Part 1. Live, love, laugh, then die early. Working life during the ancient civilizations was so different because the conditions were so different. A life expectancy of some 30-some years meant your short-lived career was likely A, very short-lived, and B, in back-breaking labor. And that goes double for the slaves. Your day finished when your boss said it was finished, and the crack of a whip did more to motivate you than office posters of cats hanging from trees. And it didn't matter whether you were pushing around stones, rowing galleys, or fanning the pharaoh with a big palm leaf. Your last day on the job was when they carried you out in a body bag. The same was true for flashier careers, too. Had you been lucky enough to be born into an elite family, perhaps you'd be fast-tracked to the Senate floor as a high-ranking soldier, assuming you didn't catch a disease first. In any case, your life's prospects were controlled by your social standing. On the flip side, anyone who lived long enough to get wrinkles was respected by society despite not being physically able to contribute to it. Their wisdom and experience were seen as divine. So when you were in the labor market, you were treated like garbage. But as soon as you survived it, you had street cred. Yet, your retirement relied on your own savings and family support. Without that, each day relied on the kindness of strangers. Unless you had a Roman military pension, of course. When a soldier's tenure serving Caesar had wrapped up, they'd receive a decade's worth of pay, plus a piece of land to call home. It was called Arrarium Militare, and instituted by Augustus, the first Roman emperor in 13 BC. Yet, as progressive as it seems, it wasn't motivated by the goodness of the Roman emperor's heart. He did it to stop veterans and young men causing trouble, either by supporting a coup or just being bored. Up until then, ancient civilizations recruited young men to deal with specific threats. You'd be herding sheep one day and then hunting a cyclops the next. But when Rome transitioned from a republic to an empire, it was time to turn the military into a real profession. Interestingly, the pension plan was greeted with hostility. Even back then, citizens protested over retirement policies. That's because funding came from a portion of new taxes, inheritance tax, and sales tax. Sure, some came from any loot plundered during the Roman Empire expansion, and even Augustus threw in some of his own cash to get the thing off the ground. But the immediate financial burden meant retirement almost fell at the first hurdle. Thankfully, citizens warmed up to the idea of not working until the day they die once they saw the visible benefits of the scheme. From that point on, the groundwork was set for a new way of thinking about work but it took a lot of time and radical thinking to get where we are now. So it's time to learn how history works as we figure out when was retirement invented and when will it die? This week's video is sponsored by MyHeritage. MyHeritage is the leading global service for family history and DNA testing, trusted by 90 million users. As someone who loves history, understanding my family lineage is super important to me. It's quite literally the history of my family. MyHeritage makes building your family tree easy. Simply type in the names of your relatives, and it helps you populate the data for you. MyHeritage sources information from over 19 billion historical documents. And to be honest, I'm fascinated with just how far back they can pull records from. I found relatives that lived in the 1800s. This was made easy with instant discoveries, which helps you build your family tree simply with the click of a button. It spots a relative and finds their relatives, and then your family tree just gets bigger. I've learned that one of my paternal great-grandfathers started a brewery in Germany, and it's still around today. You bet I'm going to try it. You can upload photos, colorize them, and see what your ancestors would look like with their AI tools. And the research function allows you to search historical documents to find out much more information about your family than you'd ever know. Start using MyHeritage to get to know your family's history. Sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer by clicking the link below in the description or scanning this QR code. Part 2. Working Night and Day
The Middle Ages ushered in a new way to structure society, and a new way to view work, and it's all thanks to dividing land into private and public space. Broadly speaking, the time of feudalism and knights saw society fragmented into more tiers than an MLM wedding cake. Everyone had a boss, and every boss had a boss, and everyone had the same monarch. But it also meant that every person had a community. So, although the Roman Empire's pension plans hadn't mapped into medieval Europe exactly, the respect towards one's fellow man had become stronger. Caring for the elderly was more of a natural role than an act of charity. Multi-generational families lived under the same thatched roof, splitting work according to each person's utility. Male strength lent well to the physical demands of farming, whereas women could spend time weaving textiles as it afforded more time with the children. Plus, weaving could be interrupted should a youngster veer too close to the fireplace. The elderly filled in the cracks. Their experience guided the young farmhands, their wisdom aided the raising of infants, and their skills were perfectly suited to household management. But with everyone bonding together, the financial burden for retirement still mostly rested on your family, unless you used a cheat code, joining the church. Joining a monastery or a convent might be a far cry from a 401k, but it was a roof over your head and food in your belly. Utterly wisdom was as sacred here as it was during the ancient civilizations, so you just needed to adhere to the vows of your local Christian hub to enjoy leisurely days of quiet meditation, contemplation, and tending to the flower garden. Financial support came from the community, and sometimes from newly recruited monks. Think of it like a membership fee. And if monk mode wasn't for you, you could rely on your guild. During the medieval ages, the emergence of craftsmen and communal ways of life required guilds to maintain production standards and facilitate training. If you were an artisan or merchant, then chances are your guild had what we in the modern age would recognize as health insurance. You'd pay your dues and in return, received coverage should you be affected by illness, disability, or frailty. This was a step up from the Roman soldier pensions, because now a retirement plan could be organized on a local level, rather than rely on intervention from the upper echelons. Work started to be viewed more through an individualist lens, but these two methods only applied to the peasantry. Lords, knights, and royalty had an entire feudal system to keep them enjoying the finer things in life. Granted, your estate would likely be handed over to a descendant who could evict you if things got really tense, or execute you if things got really tense. But it just goes to show that every stratum of society felt a sense of personal duty to care for their relatives. It would take a couple hundred years before the government viewed it as their responsibility. Part 3. Business and Bismarck the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s gave the individualist view of work a second wind, though not immediately. Centering factories as the driving force of this new economy saw exponential growth and radical technological development. Now, work was all about production and innovation. It focused on outputting things that average people could afford, but the emergence of a consumer marketplace shaped society irrevocably. The labor divide of the old agrarian way of life was erased, and working hours were dictated by the sound of the factory's whistle instead of the crow of a rooster. Kids were dragged off family farms and into the harsher labor force. The class divide widened. Social mobility was tougher. A saturated pool of low-skilled workers meant a day's work wasn't guaranteed. Your top hat wearing boss had immense power over your daily hours, quality of life, and even family structure. A veteran worker could no longer lean on guilds or religious institutions during their later years. So forget about retiring. You worked until you were fired or dropped dead. Unless you had a fortune, you'd be considered a blight. But when workers pushed back against the draconian rules of Victorian factory work life, the fight for labor rights became a lengthy and bloody battle. Enter Otto von Bismarck, the so-called Iron Chancellor of Germany. Born 1815 and died in 1898, his life was characterized by a lengthy career in politics where he started wars, unified countries, and wore armor under his clothes because he was so paranoid about being assassinated. But his most enduring legacy was creating the world's first welfare state. Thanks to this twirly mustache Prussian diplomat, retirement went from an abstract concept to a tangible reality. Yet, like the Roman Emperor Augustus, the motivation for a state-supported pension plan wasn't entirely down to selfless reasons. The late 19th century was a period of immense industrialization and urbanization, but also labor unrest and civil disputes. Socialism and communism were on the rise. Bismarck recognized their popularity as a threat to the German Empire, whereas other leaders couldn't imagine revolution sweeping the globe. To them, this Karl Marx guy was a trend, a fad, no different than goths or emos. Well, the Russian Revolution of 1917 proved just how serious a threat it actually was, 
That's why Bismarck was something of a genius for nipping it in the butt way back in 1889. His revolutionary idea for a state-sponsored social insurance program covered health insurance, accident insurance, and you guessed it, retirement. But it required delicate planning to pull off. One wrong move, and he could ignite a rebellion, either from rioting unions or elitist right-wingers. For starters, the age of 70 was selected as the retirement age due to life expectancy at the time. This felt fair and realistic, and bought the policy some time to prove it could work. Next came the funding. As the Iron Chancellor, Bismarck already had experience with the nitty-gritty of budgets, so he proposed that both employers and employees contribute to their retirement plan. The state's pension scheme was positioned more as a safety net for the aging working class. He floated the idea and waited to see if they would take it. Conservatives were concerned about the financial burden on businesses, and socialists saw these ideas as half-measured attempts to placate workers without giving them real empowerment. However, history shows that most people supported it. By creating this first-of-a-kind policy, Bismarck killed two birds with one stone. He quelled the anger of labor movements and strengthened their loyalty to him. For the first time in human history, Bismarck had pulled off a formalized retirement plan. In time, Bismarck's first step would be emulated around the world, marking a seismic shift in a government's responsibility to its people. The big question, though, would be whether a welfare state could survive the hard times ahead. Bismarck may have been a visionary, but not even he could foresee the Great Depression. Part 4. Fine-tuning or cashing out? It's hard to defend funding a retirement plan for others when you're unemployed. But when Franklin D. Roosevelt took office in 1933, right at the height of the Great Depression, he had the ripe blend of charity and chutzpah to improve the welfare state. FDR was born into a wealthy family in 1882, yet his political career was marked by progressive social stances. Part of his personal philosophy was influenced by surviving a bout of polio when he was a young man, he bounced back with a renewed sense of purpose and resilience, which would resonate with the despairing voters of the early 20th century. During his first 100 days in office, Roosevelt implemented the New Deal to take economic problems head-on. These included bold actions like public work projects, finance reforms, and regulations, all aimed at restoring dignity and prosperity to the downtrodden American folk. But it was the Social Security Act of 1935 that cemented retirement as a part of the American dream. Much like Bismarck's radical policies of the previous decades, Roosevelt's acts made sure retirement was no longer a luxury of the few. Now, everyone could have it, especially the old, unemployed, and disabled. Never again did Americans need to work until they were physically unable to do so. The act also established a system for victims of industrial accidents, the type of thing that every Victorian factory worker would have dreamed of. Yet, there was still resilience. Once again, the concerns from previous civilizations were echoed. There were fears over additional pressure on the business community. There were concerns over giving the government too much reach in the daily lives of citizens. There were worries over the economy being weighed down by excessive taxation, which could stifle individual initiative. Though the system has remained in place for almost 100 years, some of the criticism has proved correct. Demographic shifts have caused financial strain. Longer life expectancies and fluctuating birth rates have put its sustainability into question. Some wonder whether it's possible to reform the welfare state or whether its usefulness has run its course. One such critic is the prominent 21st century political scientist Jacob Hacker. His seminal work is called The Great Risk Shift. In this work, he argues how the responsibility for retirement planning has shifted away from the government and employers to fall back on the shoulders of workers. In essence, we're back to the days of the Roman Republic before soldiers got a pension plan, except now Social Security is a mere illusion. Okay. That's not exactly what he says, but you get the point. His meticulous investigations highlight how the move from a defined benefits pension to a defined contribution plan like 401ks means the risk of changing economies is more your problem than the employer's. That might not mean much in an era where self-employment is so common, but should an Amazon warehouse worker really be more worried about how to provide employee benefits than Jeff Bezos? This makes planning for retirement a heck of a lot harder, Hacker says, but also raises questions about how adequate your savings will be in the future. I mean, it's not like America has never seen market crashes wipe away citizens' life savings where elites responsible get away scot-free, right? He points to how many graduate workers start their first job without health insurance now that their employer no longer has the responsibility or cannot adequately provide it. However, hackers critics have been quick to point out that privatizing risk can encourage individuals to make wiser financial decisions. This should, in theory, stimulate economic growth by nurturing a responsive market. There's also the spread of financial education thanks to innovative technology. After all, we're all better with our money since watching How Money Works, am I right? 
Compare your level of financial education to that of the average person 100 years ago. Surely now is the time to place more retirement responsibility on ourselves, especially when you consider how new tech has created new industries, flexibility, and education. Before, work options were limited. Now you can make a Forbes 100 company in your bedroom with the same computer tech everyone else has. I'm not saying everyone should become a Twitch streamer who studies day trading at an online university. I'm just saying that if we're on the precipice of a new society, you can understand why critics think a formal retirement plan should go the way of the Roman Empire. Maybe a retirement plan was needed when workers had no rights, but it's obsolete when workers had so many privileges. Or maybe you think it burdens the younger generations with all the risks without solving the problems of what to do with an aging population. Maybe you think we're kicking the economic can down the proverbial road. Or maybe you think retirement plans have always been a Ponzi scheme because it relies on the financial contributions from the newest members of the workforce. Let us know which side of progress you're on by making your argument in the comment section below. And if you like this video, make sure to check out our video on the history of unions. Thanks again to MyHeritage, the leading global service for family history and DNA testing for making it possible for everyone to keep on learning how history works.